Hello, BookTube. I have a small mail haul here. Uh, it may end up being the only video I do today, so I thought we'd go through it together, see what kind of trouble we can get into. Uh, we'll start with this little thing. Thought for sure from last night's weather forecast that I would be book hauling from the middle of a blizzard, but no, <laughs> not so far. Uh, let's see. Okay. Uh, this comes out in May. I don't I don't recognize it. It's A Nation Unmade by War by, by Tom Engelhardt. A Tom Dispatch book. I don't know what that means. Uh, from the election from hell to the future according to Donald Trump, A Nation Unmade by War surveys American exceptionalism in the age of absurdity. Okay, as veteran author Tom Engelhardt argues, despite having a more massive, technologically advanced, and better funded military than any other power on the planet, in the last decade and a half of constant war across the greater Middle East and parts of Africa, the United States has won nothing. Its unending wars, in fact, have only contributed to, the world, to a world growing more chaotic by the second. From its founding, the United States has been a, a nation made by wars. Through incisive analysis and characteristic wit, Engelhart ponders whether in this century its citizenry and government will be unmade by them. Okay, so this is Haymarket Books, fairly small publisher, uh, and this sounds like a political screed of the type that at the beginning of 2017 I told myself, I, or 2018 I told myself I would no longer read, but uh, now I'm kind of back in the game, so I will probably end up reading this thing, and it will probably infuriate me. Um, but <laughs> we shall see. Let's uh, let's move on here. Oh, okay, wonderful. All right, this is the finished copy of the book that comes out this month. I believe this is a March release. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh huh. Okay, yes, late March. Uh, this is the Fighter by Michael Farris Smith. A very nice finished copy. Um, which is, let's see here, if I remember correctly, when I first got this, we talked about it, and it, it's, if I remember correctly, it's Hicklet. Um, the acres and acres of fertile soil, the 200-year-old antebellum house, all gone. And so is the woman who gave it to Jack, the foster mother only days away from dying, her mind eroded by dementia, the family legacy she entrusted to Jack, now owned by banks and strangers. And Jack's mind has begun to fail, too. The decades of bare-knuckle fighting are now taking their toll, as concussion after concussion forces him to carry around a stash of illegal painkillers and a notebook of names that separate friend from foe and remind him of dangerous haunts to avoid. <sighs> okay. All right, and uh, the author, Michael Ferris Smith, is the author of The Fighter, Desperation Road, Rivers, and the Hands of Strangers. He's been awarded the Mississippi Author Award for Fiction and the Transatlantic Review Award and the Brick Street Press Short Story Award. Okay, so a lot of editors have found him very worthwhile. I have not read the advanced copy yet. Uh, his novels have appeared on Best of the Year lists in Esquire, Southern Living, Book Riot, and numerous other publications. Uh, and he lives in Oxford, Mississippi with his wife and daughters. Okay, so this is this is what I've been what I've talked about on this channel before. It's a kick in, in the behind for me when I get a finished copy of a book in the same month that I'm currently living in. To it's a kick in the behind for me to get to it. <laughs> so so I will do that uh, so that I so that I can speak for this thing in a week. Uh, I, I guess I'll just do this this week. Uh, you won't. Those of you who've been watching this channel will know already the slight tone of exasperation that you can no doubt detect in my voice, which is uh, the utter uh, surreality of most contemporary fiction. That it, it outstrips science fiction and fantasy by a mile, and yet is considered realistic. I mean, you know, the people, its devotees, look down on science fiction and fantasy when uh, a, a novel in which a character has taken so many punches to the head that he has to carry around a notebook telling him who's his friend and who his enemy... That is pure science fiction. That is, that is, that is a kind of weird uh, grotesquerie that writers often just 
trot on stage as middle America. <laughs> I've been, I've spent a lot of time in middle America and it's the grotesqueries. The middle Americans, people in the Midwest of America, the great plains find the grotesqueries every bit as weird and odd as anybody else would. Uh, so we, we get, we get a, a one, two combo here, nonfiction and fiction, both of which are in one way or another purporting to be dispatches from so-called Trump country. And that, wears on my one good nerve <laughs> but we shall see I, I uh, need to read the book to make to make sure uh, or to know maybe that I'm wrong uh, ah okay this is While You Were Gone by Sybil Baker I think we saw this before as well this might be a finished copy maybe they're doing this in paperback uh, this is a June book yeah it's paperback uh, when their father is diagnosed with terminal cancer uh, two sisters living in the American South or three sisters living in the American South, cope with the loss in different ways. Recovering from divorce and collapsing journalism industry, Shannon manages a, a bottom feeder rag and considers having a child for her cousin and his lover, an army veteran. After Paige is kicked out of her band, she becomes obsessed with a reclusive songwriter she wants to make famous against his will. Claire's family and career are threatened by her attraction to a new hire she supervises, an African-American who ignites her passion for literature and the deeper questions it asks of her. But when, the families, uh, uh, when their family's uncovered secrets threaten all they've known, the sisters will have to choose between their li the lives they've dreamed of and those they love. And it's inspired uh, by Chekhov's three sisters, and also, as you could obviously tell from that, uh, from that summary, by King Lear. Uh, and this is another one that I, I believe I have an advanced copy of it, and I haven't got to it. But this one I'm not kicking myself for, because this is the summer. So I wouldn't, except in extraordinary circumstances, I wouldn't, I probably wouldn't read it this far ahead of time. Anyway, uh, let's see, let's see what's next. Let's see, what is this next one? Oh my, oh my. Okay. All right. This comes out in June. Very nice. Okay. Wasn't sure. I didn't request this. I wasn't sure I was going to get it without begging for it. Uh, okay. I don't have a finished cover to show you. The finished cover is quite striking. This is the advanced copy of I Will Be Complete by Glenn David Gold. It's a memoir by the author of a great book called Sunnyside and an even greater book, a fantastic American novel called Carter Beats the Devil which I'm sure there are some of you out there that I have given it to. People say to me, you know, what's a contemporary novel that's really good, really smart, but also really enjoyable, where it's not just a, a bleak fest and, <laughs> and where the punchline is an incest over and over again. <laughs> and and uh, Carter Beats the Devil is one of the books that I go, there are about 30 books on that list that I just say, okay, here is a contemporary novel. You don't want to read a classic. Okay, fine. You don't want to read anything nonfiction. Okay, fine. You don't want to read any genre fiction. Okay, fine. Here's a contemporary novel, something written in the last 30 years in mainstream literature that is both brilliant and incredibly enjoyable to read. Here you go. They do exist. There are plenty of them. You can thank me when you're finished. Uh, Carter Beats the Devil is one of those books. Uh, and uh, this is the author's memoir. And when I first heard this announced, it surprised me. Because I just don't expect authors to write memoirs. Because they are intensely boring. <laughs> uh, let's see. Glenn David Gold was raised rich, briefly, at the end of the go-go 1960s. But his father's fortune disappeared. His parents divorced, and Gold fell out of his well-curated life in Southern California and into San Francisco at the epicenter of the me decade, the inimitable 1970s. Gold grew up with his mother among con men and get-rich schemes. Then, one afternoon when he was 12, she moved to New York without telling him, leaving him to fend for himself. Okay. All right. <laughs> okay, I take that that boring bit. <laughs> uh, I will be complete is the story of how Gold coped, honing a keen wit and learning how to fill in the emotional gaps. He leads us through his early salvation at boarding school, his dream job as an independent at an independent bookstore in L.A. in 1983, a punk rock riot, a romance with a, fem a femme fatale to the soundtrack of R.E.M., and the beginning of his career as a writer. Okay. 
Fantastic. All right. So, okay. All right. So, uh, so he is avoiding the writer, the, the trap of writer uh, of writer memoirs being boring by writing his own story as though it were one of his novels, which every writer should do, and none of them do. So few of them do, and if they did, it would be my favorite kind of writing. But they don't do it. That <laughs> just uh, <laughs> just drives me nuts. And then this this doesn't happen. So that that sounds fantastic. Oh boy, fantastic! All right, so that's the summer. Uh, wonderful. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's see here. Because you have to, you know, it's it's a story anyway. And just because the I is you doesn't mean you that the I is not a character in a story. <laughs> Maybe that's just an excessively Irish way of looking at one's own personal past. <laughs> oh, fantastic. Okay, great. I think this is the summer as well. Yeah, this is June as well. Uh, this is Matthew Pearl. This is the Dante Chamber. The uh, the sequel to the Dante Club. His, his mega best-selling historical novel about the first English-language translation of Dante's Divine Comedy to be done in America, in which an unlikely group of sleuths start... Uh, start solving crimes that a maniac is basing on the tortures of the damned in Dante's Inferno. Uh, and this, well, here, let me, let me, uh, let me read you. This is the sequel. I don't know why it took this long. Uh, how wonderful. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Penguin Press is enormously excited to publish the Dante Chamber, Pearl's unforgettable follow-up to the Dante Club. The year is 1870. A man is found murdered in the public gardens of London with an enormous stone around his neck etched with a verse from the Divine Comedy. When other shocking deaths erupt across the city, all in the style of penances Dante memorialized in The Purgatory, poet Christina Rossetti fears her missing brother, the artist and writer Dante Gabriel Rossetti, will be the next victim. So the Rossettis are going to get involved, but they're not the only ones. Wait till you hear this. Christina enlists poet, the poets Robert Browning, Alfred Tennyson and uh, Dr. Oliver Wendell Holmes from from the Dante Club uh, to assist in deciphering the literary clues. Together, these unlikely investigators, unlikely, the Brownings and Tennyson, a bit unlikely. <laughs> uh, together, these unlikely investigators rush to unravel the secrets of Dante's verses in order to find Gabriel and stop the killings. More, moving between the shimmering mansions of the elite and the dark corners of London's underworld, they descend further and further into the mystery. But when the true inspiration behind the gruesome murders is finally revealed, Christina must confront a more profound terror than she could have imagined. Okay, I know nothing about this book other than the description that I've read, and that description certainly seems to be pointing an alert reader in the direction of the killer being Dante, her brother. Uh, and a uh, uh, I'm gonna have to hope that isn't true because you know he's got the name Dante, it's, uh, and, it's, and he's missing, and these murders are happening. That that would seem a little obvious, but uh, the wonderful thing uh, about it, either way, is uh, what I'm sure we, was true for the Dante Club, was true for this book, which is that no matter how obvious things get, it's gonna be wonderful to read. <laughs> so, and it's got Alfred Lord Tennyson as a sleuth. <laughs> so I'm on board. <laughs> well, then, uh, let's see here. We're working our way to the end here. No box this time around. But I don't think I'm going to get any other mail. Uh, so, let's see here. Okay, this is Harvard University Press. Uh, this comes out in July. This is Haunted by Chaos. Uh, by Sulman Wasif Khan. And the subtitle is China's Grand Strategy from Mao Zedong to uh, Jing Xingpi. The, the new Chinese premier who was, I'm not 100% sure on how to pronounce his name, but I follow his news intimately. <laughs> he, he has just been granted eternal rule. Uh, and that's always something to pay attention to in a world power. Uh, so what have we got here? In the past 60 years, China was trans has transformed itself moving to the forefront of the world stage as each successive leader of the People's Republic of China acted to secure China's place in the world and create a united nation. In Haunted by Chaos, the author examines the political, diplomatic, and economic strategies each leader of the PRC has established, suggesting that whilst each president has faced different challenges, there is a similarity in their policies that makes up a grand strategy. Yes, there is. Uh, the author writes that of all the great powers, China is perhaps the one that has seen the fewest changes in its basic philosophy. 
Okay, yes. All right, all right. And by examining what binds together the policies of the PRC's leaders, we can see to better understand the calculus behind Chinese decision-making to attempt to see the world the way Chinese, China's leaders do. Okay, all right, that's, that's a little strange. But I always find the, the pub sheets for, for Harvard books a little strange. That, that, that seems to be tap dancing around the key issue, but perhaps the book will not. The, the homogeneity of, of the Chinese government is based on repression. It's based on a restriction, censorship, uh, and extreme punishment. <laughs> so it's not the, the the point being. Although although every contemporary Chinese person that I myself know is happy, they are not free, in the sense of the word that 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 the West typically understands the term. So I I maybe maybe. Uh, internationalists would say the you know a they are and b the a westerner who uses that term just loosely isn't any more free just doesn't know it i i don't know one way or another but uh i find the subject increasingly fascinating i wasn't all that interested in it in 2016 or 2017 but in i've noticed in 2018 china draws my attention more uh so i i will gobble this book up but not right away right this comes out in the summer yeah, this comes out in July, so not right away. Uh, and then, what's this one? What is this? I haven't got anything so far that makes me just want to immediately drop everything and read it. But that can't always happen. <laughs> oh my. Okay. Hmm. Okay. Uh, well, this might just be one of those books. <laughs> this is Tim Burkhead. This is the, the wonderful Mr. Willoughby. The first true ornithologist. Isn't that a lovely cover? Uh, this is a biography of Francis Willoughby. Okay, uh, let's see here. Uh, I don't recall that I've ever read a biography of Francis Willoughby. I would be hard-pressed to even name one. Uh, he lived during the rapidly accelerating scientific revolution of the 17th century, and at a time when scholars' conception of science and nature were drastically shifting and previous conceptions were being critically scrutinized. Studying at Cambridge, Willoughby was invigorated by this revolution, and after graduation, he devoted his time to his particular fascination with birds, carefully differentiating them through identification of their distinguishing features. Soon he set off on a grand tour of Europe with his Cambridge tutor, John Ray, making stops to examine native species and view prominent specimen collections. It was on this trip that the two men were inspired to embark on the overhaul of the whole of natural history in an attempt to impose order on its messiness and complexity. But before their first book, Ornithology, could be completed, Willoughby died. And in the century since, Ray's reputation has grown, obscuring that of his collaborator. Now, for the first time, the wonderful Mr. Willoughby tells Willoughby's story and genius. Uh, uh, oh, okay, so this, this is the first Willoughby biography. Is that absolutely true? I'll have to check and see. Uh, in, this, in his too short life, Willoughby helped found the Royal Society of London, and made discoveries and asked questions that were, in some cases, centuries ahead of their time. Okay, fantastic. Uh, so this comes out in July, and the author, Tim Burkhead, is a professor at the University of Sheffield, where he teaches animal behavior and the history of science, so he's perfectly positioned to write this. Okay, fantastic. All right, so uh, that that is certainly at the head of the list of this batch so far. And we've got one more book to go. This is one of these cardboard things, and then we'll be done. I don't know if there'll be any more videos today. We'll have to wait and see. Um, let's see what this is. Oh, okay. All right, more science writing, and uh, and much closer to the day. This is uh, this is soon. Yes, this is very soon. Okay. All right. All right. You know perfectly well. You know if you're a book publicist, you know perfectly well what. If you've got one of these sheets in a book, you know perfectly well what the person looking at it wants to see. They only want to see one piece of information. Perfectly willing to read the rest of it. But they want to see that one piece of information first, before they see anything else. And that is the publication date. It's the only thing an editor or a reviewer is, wants to see first. So you shouldn't make them hunt for it. Uh, okay, April. Okay, this comes out in early April. Uh, good, so it's right around the corner. It's Darwin Comes to Town. Look at that cover. Huh? Uh, by Menno... Schultzhuisen, 
uh, Mino Schultzweisen. Uh, the subtitle is How the Urban Jungle Drives Evolution. I requested this because it sounded fascinating. The author is one of a growing number of urban ecologists studying how our man-made environments are accelerating and changing the evolution of animals and plants around us. In Darwin Comes to Town, he takes us around the world for an up-close look at just how stunningly flexible and swift-moving natural selection can be. Uh, when human populations, with human populations growing, we're having an increasing impact on global ecosystems. Yeah, just a bit. <laughs> and nowhere do these impacts overlap as much as they do in cities. The urban environment is about as extreme as it gets, and wild animals and plants that live side by side with humans need to adapt to the whole suite of challenging conditions. They must manage the city's hotter climate, the urban heat island, so quote unquote. Uh, they need to be able to live either in the semi desert of tall, rocky, and cavernous structures we call buildings, or in the pocket like oases of city parks, which pose their own dangers, including smog and free ranging dogs and cats. Uh, traffic causes continuous noise and a mist of fine dust particles and the barriers to movement for any animal that cannot fly and or burrow and food sources are mainly human derived and yet as the author shows the wildlife sharing these spaces with us is not just surviving it's evolving ways of thriving uh, i should in america we uh, at least in the northeast we're trying to be more and more conscientious of those free-ranging dogs in public parks <laughs> i uh it drives me nuts when I when I I live I'm equidistant from two huge green spaces, and when my girls were younger and we would go to those spaces, I had uh, a fat uh, little basset hound who loved everybody but was completely defenseless. Like it was like walking a manatee, and and I had a a beautiful but nervous and high strung pointer who didn't like any dogs other than my basset hound, and and would become alarmed, would bark out of alarm. Uh, and so <laughs> when I had boy beagles who were solid little knots of muscle and perfectly capable of handling themselves, I didn't so much care. But when I was walking my girls in parks, I would come across a dog just wandering down the lane with its owner having its, the dog's leash draped around her own neck so far behind that she's out of sight. It would be annoying. <laughs> it would be very annoying. My pointer would start to bark. Sometimes the other dog would go completely still, tail down, ears stationary, which is, uh, for those of you who don't speak dog, that is, I'm assessing this, but I'm okay if it gets violent. And I don't want to see that <laughs> at all. I don't want to see that at all. <laughs> and uh, there are a couple of occasions where I had to, to step in in a way that is not completely available to other dog owners. I don't actually know what other dog owners would have done in a couple of those situations. There were a couple of situations where I had to speak to that dog directly and say, shut up and sit down. <laughs> and the dog did, and then the owners would show up and I would give them a piece of my mind. And one time in particular, uh, got really bad, <laughs> really, really bad. Or I told this dog, sit down and stop that. I don't want to see that body language directed at my girls. Just sit. And the dog sat down, a little confused, but he sat down. And then, you know, a minute later, I'm wondering where on earth the owner is. A minute later, the owner comes up, arrogant as the day is long, leash around his neck, walks up to the dog and says, y you giving him trouble? I said, your dog is supposed to be on a leash. This is a public park. There are signs everywhere. Your, your dog sat down because I told him to. But if I hadn't, he might have attacked one of my dogs, the one that's barking right now. And the owner just just doubled down. Just, ah, yeah, he won't, he won't attack you unless you're doing something wrong. And I confess, booktube. <laughs> I, I lost my temper just a bit. <laughs> I, I said to the owner, oh, really? You're completely sure of that. And the owner said, yeah. And then I said to the dog, turn around, stand up, and growl at him. <laughs> and when the dog did, I said, the owner's face drained of color, and his eyes went wide. And I said to him, that's exactly how other people in this park feel. Keep a leash on this dog when you're in this park. Next time I see it, <laughs> well, anyway, <laughs> anyway, let's see who this author is. Uh, but aside from free-ranging dogs and that, that weird uh, anecdote, uh, I think that that description might be a little wrong about how unforgiving the arid cityscape is. 
arid by its definition means lack of water. And if you're smart about cities, cities collect water. Runoff, waste water, there's a lot of it. If you know where to look, there's a lot of it, a lot more, and on a lot more regular basis than you'll get, for instance, after three weeks without rain in the nearby park. Because rain is only one part of the question. The other part is uh, man-made water. So, 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 so this will be fascinating. Uh, so there we go. We have uh, Darwin comes to town. Uh, the wonderful Mr. Willoughby. Haunted by China. The Dante Chamber. <laughs> I will be complete. Where you were gone. While you were gone, sorry. The Fighter and a nation unmade by war. Look at that. <laughs> All right, so there we go. That is our mail hall for today, and if I, can be, if I can be back, I will be. Otherwise, I'll see you soon. Thank you, book two.